Good afternoon, everybody. You're all very welcome here today to what I think will be a very interesting, uh, it's certainly a timely event on political advertising online and effective data regulation. But before I begin, can I ask you to just sure that your mobiles are switched off and to remind you that the, this session, the, the speaker's time, is on record with the questions and answers Chatham House rules apply. So today we've got a very distinguished group of panellists who will be looking at this, as I said, really topical issue, but really one that's very important. It's not only that we've had a lot of discussion about it, but there's also issues uh, with ongoing investigations in the US, in the European Union, and in the UK. So our panel today will discuss the proposed regulation in this area, the long-term viability of data-driven business and the model that it uses, the future of data privacy in general, and the threat that that currency currently arises. I suppose we're all conscious that the referendum is on the, you know, the 25th of of May, but it, this is not just about this referendum. It, it raises issues really in a much more general sense, and that's what our panel will be looking at. So our first speaker today is James Lawless, TD. He's TD for Kildare North and spokesperson on science, technology, and development. But before he made that great leap into politics, he had a background in IT, financial services with focus on compliance and regulation, including data protection, corporate governance and conduct of business. And added to all of that, he's a barrister. So James, we look forward to your presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Joyce. And uh, look forward to hearing uh, everyone's questions and, and contributions later on. I think what Joyce meant about the introduction was I used to have a real job <laughs> uh, before I was in politics. But uh, anyway, that's, that's what I do now. Um, I suppose one of the most interesting books I've ever read uh, is Gun Germ Guns, Germs and Steel, uh, a book by Jared Diamond, uh, an historical uh, profile about why sort of civilizations fell, others rose, uh, why the Incas were defeated by the Spaniards, you know, why the South Sea Islanders are conquered by James Cook and the British and all the rest of it. One of the findings of that book is that technology played a huge part in all these conquests. If you were better, the better the understanding of technology, be it steel, be it guns, uh, be it crops, agriculture, the more likely you were to survive and the more likely you were to be uh, dominated by a more powerful uh, opponent. The same goes for elections today. I think elections, free elections, and democracy is under attack. I think it's under attack in Ireland, it's under attack in the Western world, uh, and further afield. Um, so I think it's really important that we defend ourselves and we take steps to understand what's happening and guard against it. Um, the evidence is there. Uh, we're, we're talking about social media campaigning, online campaigning, I suppose I was asked why I, I've legislation to talk about in a few moments uh, to try to safeguard it against this in Ireland. Where, where did all this come from? Uh, some people say, well, is this happening for real? Is there any evidence? Uh, last week, the US Congress saw 3,500 fake ads, uh, Russian ads, uh, that were unveiled to it by Facebook, uh, released. Uh, that's only the tip of the iceberg. Uh, Twitter had 50,000 Russian fake accounts during the US elections. Uh, during Brexit, the Guardian newspaper, which is done really great work on this, highlighted that of the top 10 influential Twitter accounts in the Brexit debate, uh, one of the top 10, at least one of the top 10, was a Russian bot account. So Russians have certainly been very busy. Uh, and it's not just them. Uh, it happens closer to home as well. Uh, sometimes people say, well, this is all very esoteric. You know, or do we really have the Russian intelligence agency working in Ireland or other such uh, threats? Uh, well, it doesn't have to be one source. Uh, I'm sure people here remember a man called Sean Gallagher. Uh, ran for the presidential election, yes. 2011, before social media was popular or profitable. Uh, arguably, the whole election hinged on a fake tweet, a fake account. Yeah. So this is not new, this is not esoteric, it's not, it's not international, it's happening already in Irish elections. Uh, we have the referendum on at the moment, but we all know, uh, and we have, um, I suppose, a huge focus on that, and, and groups like Liz from the Transparent Referendum Initiatives here today uh, have been doing great work in sort of highlighting the potential abuses and some of the activities uh, in the referendum space uh, with fake news and with different uh, groups and different accounts being uh, manipulated uh, and opinions being manipulated. Uh, so we're, we're very aware of that. 
we've seen a trend uh, in the last maybe week where multinational corporations, Google and Facebook in particular, are <coughs> making their own rules and coming out sort of very, very late in the day and saying, we're going to ban all ads or we're going to ban international ads or whatever it is. I think this is a step forward, but I think, I think it's probably too far in the case of Google. Um, but I think we shouldn't be leaving it to global companies to decide what our electoral laws uh, should be about. Um, I think it's also important that we, we're very balanced with how we do this, that, that we make sure all sides get a fair hearing or a fair dishearing, as the case may be. Um, it was interesting when Trump was elected, one of the first things that he said, uh, and I confess I'm not a Trump supporter, uh, so I might be a little bit biased, but he came out and talked about fake news being a problem. Like, this guy just put on an election because of fake news, you know, so, but it's, it's, it's not unique to any one side in any particular context, I suppose, is the point. Uh, and I think it's important that as legislators or as potential regulators, that we bring people with us across the spectrum, you know, that, that it's not seen as being done to one side or another's advantage. Uh, that's something that is, applies everywhere. Uh, but it's very insidious, and um, it happens, if we look at the patterns that we saw in the American election, some of the types of advertising that we saw, much of it was divisive. A lot of the advertising, the fake advertising, wasn't uh, supporting a particular candidate or a particular <coughs> campaign. It was actually about voter suppression, about sowing dissent, about polarizing issues, race, immigration, uh, social issues, kind of what we call wedge issues. And they were being driven up, you know, by, by opposite sides in many cases were being promoted uh, by the same agents. And again, trying to sow a division uh, and trying to uh, manipulate people. And I guess what, what they were doing it on, we know, was because of people were being micro-targeted because they had surrendered their data to the co companies, to the platforms, which then could be resold uh, to advertisers. In the case of Cambridge Analytica and, and the Kogan app, uh, in a dishonest way because it was gathered without consent. But in some cases, people actually did give consent and did fill in forms, they did fill in surveys, uh, which led to their data being manipulated. So the hopes, dreams, thoughts, ambitions were out there for advertisers to, to micro-target. I mean, the discussion about this earlier on is saying, you know, it, it comes up a lot, is that, is that such a bad thing? You know, what's so bad about micro-targeting? Uh, and one way, we've always had it. Um, everyone had a supermarket loyalty card. You know, was it 20 years ago, the first, it was a super queen at the time, or Tesco had their cards. We swipe every week, and maybe we get a discount uh, the following week on a brand of our choice. If we fly on an airline, we have a frequent flyer, frequent uh, air miles type arrangement. So, again, it's not new, and it can be beneficial, but there should be free and fair consent. We should know what we're doing. We should know what we're signing up to. And we should be should be should be brought into that, um, but there are difficulties with it. Um, the first thing is uh, because we don't have any regulation in that space, uh, we have uh, the issue of equality of arms, which means that the highest bidder can actually buy democracy. So the election is available to buy whoever can put most money in the platform, whoever can mine that data to the greatest extent, whoever can run advertisements to the greatest extent, um, is flouting all the rules around campaign spending, campaign donations, campaign finance. And the reason those are there in the first place is because we as a society, as many societies, have a principle that you cannot buy an election, that the highest bidder, the highest resources, should not be able to just uh, spend their way <coughs> to it. The second issue uh, is transparency. I think people have a right to know who is trying to influence them. If somebody's trying to, be they small or big or, or bidding high or low, if somebody's trying to influence you in an electoral outcome, be it change the constitution or electing a new government or a new president, you have a right to know who that is. Uh, and a lot of these kind of false flag ad campaigns where, where people pretended to be someone else, maybe it's muddied the name of their opponent, they could pretend to be their opponent's clothing, uh, or they could run something very dark or an issue-based campaign that would get people thinking without associating with a particular uh, group, which, which is very insidious. The other thing, I think, why this is a problem is not so much a regulatory issue, it's more a democratic issue. We have to be aware of echo chambers. Okay, so if we have a situation, we talk about public square, and people like Habermas and it's a well-established fact in democracy that public square discourse, be it Hyde Park or Speaker's Corner or Twitter or wherever else we go, or even here today, it's positive to have opposing views. It's good to have questions that don't agree with you. It's good to have uh, conversations because that's how we evolve, so we progress. Um, if we come into a concentric circle, if we go into market targeting, into a particular area, uh, then we, we cast the net too narrowly, and all of a sudden uh, we're only hearing our own opinions. And that's an issue called confirmation bias, where you know, we begin to believe we're all on the same side, we become more polarised, more extreme, uh, and I think that, that's a negative for democracy. <coughs> so what do we do about all this? How do, how do we combat this? Uh, in an Irish context, we have the Advertising Standards Association, who are not responsible. The BAI, Command Control Social Media. Uh, CIPO, it's outside their remit. Uh, the Referendum Commission can't, can't, has, has no role to play. The government, up until recently, have been, um, I suppose, not engaged on the issue. Uh, and pretty much everybody, you know, so, so that's fallen to civic society. And, and, people like myself and, and Eamon Ryan and other uh, opposition politicians have been, have been trying to raise these issues uh, and make some noise. 
Uh, but that's not good enough. I, I think we need legislation, you know, we need regulation, and we need to introduce the force of law. Um, the other thing, we need consistency. Because when we're talking today about social media, and we're talking online, and my bill is about online uh, campaigning, we have other channels. We have the broadcast media, so we, we have rules around TV and, and radio advertising. You cannot at the moment buy an ad on TV or radio. Now, I'm not sure that logic applies anymore. The thinking at the time was prohibitively expensive. With the advent of local and community radio stations, it may no longer be the case. Um, I think at the very least it's worth revisiting that. Is the broadcasting ban still, uh, still logical? We have rules around traditional advertising, of political advertising. If you put up posters, if you put out leaflets, you must have a name, notice the publisher, the sponsor uh, on that material. Um, again, there are 30 offences on the statute books dating back to 1992. That's a very different world, certainly pre-internet, pre-broadband, pre-social media. Uh, but also, it's 30 years ago, even outside of technology, is it not worth a look again now? Uh, and they're actually quite onerous offences. You can go to jail, I think, for five years if you fail to put the right printer on your poster. Now, nobody actually in the real world does. And uh, when I inquired recently, there's actually nobody enforcing that. So we have 30 offences on the statute books that are essentially obsolete. Uh, so I think the whole spectrum, I think, has to be revisited. Uh, personally, I'd favour a cap on election posters. I wouldn't ban them, but I'd cap them. Mm -hmm. There's no need for thousands of them to buy every land poster in Ireland every, every election. Um, so there's a couple of things we can do. It is important that whatever measures we take are ideologically neutral. I talked about having bring people on board and having, having people with us so that they don't favour any one side. Uh, it's also important to be technology neutral. And we saw with the Google ban, uh, which came into place in ads in the referendum, which kicked in last week, uh, there is evidence today, yesterday, that there's other platforms already hosting the same ads you know, on, on the similar spaces. So the, any regulation cannot be specific to Facebook or Google or Twitter or any provider. Technology moves quickly. Today's Facebook is yesterday's Bebo. You know, things move on. So it has to be technology agnostic uh, across the board. Um, I think it can be done. Uh, I think it's important that we, we also need to balance free speech uh, and make sure that people do have a say, but that we know who they are, that we have some measurement uh, and some regulation of, of who they're doing uh, and what they're about. Um, so a final thing I think that is, is worth looking at um, is fact-checking. We have, I think the journal.ie were the first to do it. Um, I think Facebook have partnered with them recently in terms of fact-checking. Uh, fact-checking sites can be very helpful for, for the advent of fake news and people can challenge a particular claim and have, have you know, an expert uh, review it. But I don't think they're a panacea because one person's fact check is another person's biased opinion. Um, so I think, I think it's really important that, that we stand away <coughs> from that. Um, I think there's many other things we could do. We, you know, we, we could look at the, um, one thing I mentioned before was it, the current rules applied 30 days before a vote. Um, we all know it's six months before a vote people are campaigning, you know, six weeks before a vote. But the, even, even the current very modest limited rules that we have uh, only kick in with months to go. Um, I have legislation before the dawn. Uh, the opposition parties all supported it when it came before the House before Christmas. It's moved very slowly. Uh, the government, um, I understand, are coming on board. Uh, it won't be obvious in time for the referendum, but I do, we, we have many more votes. We have up to six to ten referenda expected over the next 12 months. We have local elections, European elections, general elections, probably over the next 12 months as well. It's really important to get it right. Uh, if you look across the international scene, uh, the Honest Ads Act in the US is a similar piece of legislation. Speaking to American colleagues recently, American counterparts, the Democrats are advancing that, the Republicans are blocking it. It probably won't advance in the near future. Uh, Germany has attempted to do this. They've taken a slightly different approach. They've tried to censor free speech. You know, the, uh, sorry, fake news, but there's a free speech issue there. Uh, they're talking about hate speech and how do you define that? More difficult to do. Um, South American companies, you know, uh, legislators are looking at this. The Canadians have tried to do it, but more or less given up. They said they can't do it. So it's possible. Um, I think it would be great if we did. Ireland could actually be the, the flag bearer here. Uh, if my legislation, you know, with amendments and, and cross party, it doesn't have to be, you know, all about my proposals. But if that legislation gets through the House, which it may very well do later this year, and um, there's no reason why Ireland couldn't actually be, be the flag bearer and actually have the opportunity to get it right. Uh, and just to finish on a, I suppose, a what if, and it's, again, it's a positive story for Ireland. Could have been a positive story. Uh, we all know about Cambridge Analytica and, and Alexander Cogan and the app that was exploited and the, I think the number keeps on growing is that 70 million people now uses the data that was mined and put into used it in various elections afterwards. The Irish Data Protection Commissioner in 2012 identified a problem with third party consent on Facebook. They identified an issue with the app and the app collected data. The Irish DPC flagged that uh, to Facebook. Facebook didn't act, I think they acted two years later. If the, if the Irish DPC had been listening in 2012, mm. Alexander Cogan couldn't have ran his app out of Cambridge University in 2013. Cambridge Analytica couldn't have mined in 2014. Uh, Brexit may not have happened in, in 2016. And maybe Donald Trump would still be doing hotels. So look, at, there's a, listen to Irish people, I suppose, is, is the message. And maybe we could be a, a, a trailblazer in this space. Thank you very much.
Thanks very much, James. Now we'll move on to our next speaker, uh, Fred Logue, and Fred is the principal with FP Logue and the solicitors in Dublin, who specialise in technology, intellectual property, data protection and information law. Fred himself specialises, as you'd expect, in technology, intellectual property, information law and commercial law, but he's the leading information lawyer advising on freedom of information, requests, access to environmental information, uh, data protection and privacy. So Fred, we look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, <clears throat> thanks to the Institute for the invitation to speak. Um, so I suppose in the, in the late 1950s, um, the, the birds stopped singing uh, and um, people began to wonder why. So in, in 1962, an environmental scientist called Rachel Carson uh, wrote a book called Silent Spring that documented the adverse effects on the environment of large-scale use of pesticides, um, which, which ha ha kind of had been developed following the Second World War with the, the growth of the chemicals industry. She also documented that the disinformation campaigns that <coughs> these industries used to spread and the fact that public officials basically accepted industry claims without question. Uh, and um, the, the pattern revealed by Rachel Carson in the 1960s is a pattern that we all know has played out time and time again, where big industries would do something harmful. So we just have to think about tobacco, uh, uh, semiconductor manufacturing, that would contaminate the natural environment, and they would spend more effort and time covering it up and lobbying to prevent uh, the harm being addressed than, uh, than they would have actually had to spend to, to do it right in the first place. Uh, and the great thing, obviously, it's not, not great to pollute the environment. I don't think anyone can disagree with that. But the great thing about Carson's work in the 60s and the early 70s was that the US government, and particularly a Republican administration, took no note of what had happened and brought in a new era of, of environmental regulation. And it was Richard Nixon, for all his, his sins, who um, uh, set up the Environmental Protection Agency in the US. And that took away from the US Department of Agriculture the, ju the dual role of both regulator and promoter of the, the chemicals industry and agriculture uh, and put into an independent body. And the other thing that uh, resulted was that tools, regulatory tools were developed, most notably something called the Environmental Impact Assessment, uh, where instead of building your factory and then seeing who died and fighting the rest of the people until they died in court, that you would assess the environmental impacts of certain uh, activities and developments that were likely to have an effect on the environment in advance. So this radical idea that you actually m make sure that you don't harm people before you do something risky uh, uh, had to be invented and had to be forced through by the Americans. And now this, this concept spread around the world. We have it in EU law, we have it in, in, in um, via the Aarhus Convention and things like that. And, and, and that's the norm and people, people accept that and buy into that. <coughs> um, so, so now we bring ourselves to the 21st century, uh, and the mental environment is under threat. So the, came, the revelations about Cambridge Analytica, uh, that wealthy individuals are using shady com uh, companies to gather detailed personal information about huge proportions of an electorate, uh, and, and spending that money on very uh, well-crafted ads that are designed to influence people at an emotional or a psychological level, uh, both in the US and in the, um, and, in, and, in, and in the UK, as James has talked about in terms of the Brexit debate. So in my view, this Cambridge Analytica revelation, which, which actually came out, uh, I think, on the day that the Data Protection Bill was published, <laughs> which was great timing, actually, uh, is the silent spring of the digital age. The birds have stopped singing in our heads. Uh, the, the music has stopped playing uh, in terms of social media. Uh, 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 and and we're, we're looking at the the carcasses of, 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 of birds on the ground, uh, for want of a better word. But, and it's, I think it's clear to me, and we were talking about over lunch, but it, it is clear to me that this type of unregulated use of personal data by powerful organisations can be and has a, a direct adverse effect on, on the political sphere. <clears throat> but you don't have to look hard to see other examples. Even today, uh, there was a, a further revelation about the, uh, the public services card, which the state knows or ought to know is an illegal biometric ID card. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Uh, the police seem to be rolling out a national surveillance uh, system on the roads network using automatic number plate recognition, possibly facial recognition. Uh, and, and, and this is despite three or four very, very definitive and unambiguous decisions of the European courts mm. that mass surveillance is illegal and that mass processing or unjustified mass processing of personal data is, is fundamentally incompatible with European values and European uh, uh, fundamental rights. But not, not only that, in my own practice we're seeing uh, children being targeted with, uh, being profiled for uh, junk food advertising, gambling, alcohol. Mm. Mm. The, uh, you don't ha I don't think there's a great leap for anyone to accept that these things are or could be happening. <clears throat> you know, companies that were set up with the noble purpose of connecting everyone or organizing the world's information have now mut mutated into vast sur surveillance tools which are at the disposal of anyone who has enough money to access them. Uh, uh, and the vainglorious attempts at voluntary self-regulation uh, um, aren't fooling anyone, to be honest. <clears throat> so the mental birds have, have definitely stopped singing. Uh, and the question is, that where, where do we go from here? Uh, so we have a ch I think we have a choice. We can continue with self-regulation and hope for the best. Uh, but risk subverting our democracy, uh, risk uh, turning our children into gambling addicts and uh, making them obese. Or we can say that uh, society deserves better than this. That we, and as James has mentioned, that we need to, to have some form of regulation. And I think the, the model is there from environmental law, which I also practice in. Uh, in and, and some of the tools are already to be seen in the GDPR. So we already have now a concept of a data protection impact assessment. We already have a concept of prior checking uh, with, the, with the regulator. Uh, in, in my view, I think what we're going to see is that there will be a type of planning permission for certain types of personal data processing. So not only will our regulator be an enforcer, they will also be a permitting authority. So that before you do a Cambridge Analytica type of scenario, you have to go to an independent state regulator you have to make information available to the public. You have to give them the opportunity to comment on it. Uh, and there has to be a published decision. With, and then with enforcement to make sure that uh, whatever plan or whatever, um, wh whatever proposal is, is, is carried out within the terms of the, of the, of the, um, of the permission. So, uh, so that's my proposition. Um, I think the stakes are too high for it not to be regulated. Uh, uh, and I think my prediction is that there will be, that it'll follow the same path as environmental regulation in the future. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Fred. Um, now with our last speaker, Professor Barry O'Sullivan, who's an award-winning academic in the field of AI, data analytics, data ethics, constraints, programming and operations research, a wide, wide area. But um, Barry, I think, has a very um, good, well, not just a very good uh, reputation, not only for that area, but in research. He has managed to get together over 200 million uh, euros, I know, with colleagues, but also was named Science Foundation Researcher of the Year in 2016. His um, day job, if I could say, <laughs> is the director of Insight Center for Data Analytics in the Department of Computer Science at UCC, where he holds the chair of constraint programming. He's also an <coughs> adjunct professor in Monash University in, in Melbourne, Australia, and currently the deputy um, president of the European Artificial Intelligence Association, which covers about 30 Con countries and about four and a half thousand people. Mm -hmm. Barry. Look Thanks. forward to hearing your presentation too. Thanks. Um, I really wish I'd prepared some notes now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I suppose the, um, the, uh, we, we've, we're living through an absolutely transformational time. Um, the iPhone basically didn't exist in 2007. Well, it, it, was, it just came on the market in 2007. And you know, we had no idea what this, kind of, what this technology was going to have, what kind of impact it was going to have on us as citizens. We never imagined a time where people would be sharing photographs, looking for people to like them. If someone walked down O'Connell Street holding a photograph of their dog and kept on putting it into your face and said, do you like it, do you like it? You know, um, you know people would, you'd probably, you'd probably be pretty much arrested at that point, right? So, the, um, so our behavior online is totally different to what it is um, offline. I suppose the other thing that's important to realize is that 
um, the corporations that are um, in operation in that sphere are bigger than any country. So um, there are, I think, about 2 billion monthly users of Facebook. Um, there are only 1.2 billion people in China. There are about a billion people in India. Um, the only thing bigger in, on the planet in terms of membership is Christianity. Right, so that's the only, and in fact, I'm not even quite sure if any particular Christian church is bigger than Facebook. It's a huge thing. And I suppose over the last um, eight to ten years, we've given away massive amounts of information about ourselves. Um, and of course, we've done that very willingly, because we enjoy seeing those cat videos. We enjoy the fact that um, we can see what our neighbor is doing. We like to project a... We like to project a very beautiful image of how our lives actually are. Uh, and because my life, my life needs to look as good as your life, then I don't tell you all the bad stuff. Now, I suppose factored into all of this is the fact that you know, technology has moved to the point where we can do incredible things with technology. So you know, in the last 10 years, well, maybe a bit more than that, maybe 12 years, you know, we have built a self-driving car. So um, they're not as, you know, some people say, well, these things are not safe. They're actually statistically safer than human beings driving cars. Uh, but we still don't like the idea of a car killing a person. Um, just, to put it into, just to put it into consider, just to put it into context, um, human beings driving cars kill about 1.2 million people every year. Um, all war, violence, and drugs kills about 1.6 million people every year. Um, so we almost kill as many people driving our cars as every form of violence and sort of uh, egregious behaviour we can imagine. Yet we wouldn't, we don't, we still don't like that technology. So there's a, there's a we have a funny relationship with technology. Uh, there's a very um, there's a great book uh, written by Cathy O'Neill called Weapons of Math Destruction, and it's a it's a book about um, how big data um, and there's a lot of things we can talk about that at great length, but you know large amounts of data. Um, images and so on can be used for um, all sorts of negative impacts on us. Now, I suppose we know what we can do technically. Um, I suppose the question is, is it really true that, um, that information online is actually affecting how we vote and how we behave in elections? Um, and I suppose the scientists are out on that. Um, so we don't know for sure. So we don't know with certainty, in, well, in scientific certainty, whether that is happening or not. But I think, as, as James said in his address, um, the evidence would suggest that that really is happening. And I suppose the question is, um, what would it take for us to actually accept that this is a possibility and that we should actually do something? And I think seeking transparency is, a, is one very proper step, right? So I think that's, that's something that we really should do. So I think, um, I'm not a member of Fianna Fáil, but it's a, I think it's a very fine piece of legislation. I think it's, a, it's, a, it's the first step on a, on a great path. Um, I suppose in terms of, um, in terms of you know, what is this data revolution, I think you know, Facebook and you know, Instagram, all the social media companies, um, they provide a service to us, they connect us in some way, they give us free services, but of course the currency in which we pay is our data. And so the purpose of these platforms is essentially to get as much information out of us as possible so that they can basically advertise to us, right? So that is, that is the business model, there's no great secret in that. Um, and I suppose what's interesting to me about the Cambridge Analytica story is that Cambridge Analytica has been around for, for quite a long time. And it's only in very recent times that people have sort of sat up and sort of taken notice because of this data set that they got uh, through you know, what we regard as improper means. Um, but in fact, what Cambridge Analytica does every single day of the week is simply, and you know, I'm, not, I'm not a sympathizer or a supporter of Cambridge Analytica, but what it's doing is just simply using social media platforms in precisely the way that they have been designed to uh, to activate. You know, there are two billion monthly users, any one of those can buy advertising for whatever purpose um, and they can uh, transmit that, that, that message you know, to, to those two billion people if they so wish to pay for it. Um, that's what the platforms do. And I suppose one thing we should bear in mind about these about um, social media platforms is that the currency is data. 
the people who are trying to um, you know, personalize to you are not necessarily trying to um, uh, upset the election. They're not necessarily trying to turn the referendum. Some of them are, but lots of them just want you to engage in the platform to reveal more about yourself. And so I suppose we need to sit back and sort of think about what are the motivations of these sorts of people and how do we police it? And it is very, very difficult. When the internet was imagined, it was imagined as this sort of utopia where every single user was exactly the same as every other user. And so no allowances were made for people who uh, were young. So the, the children, for example, as, uh, as Fred mentioned, no special allowances were was made for children. Children are on the internet in exactly the same way as we are. Um, there was no concept really of age um, appropriate content. So, you know, some of you may have seen, um, not mentioning any particular uh, groups or positions, but, you know, if you're using YouTube, say, two or three weeks ago, you'd have been seeing lots and lots of advertisements that were very strong in their content. Um, and, you know, the conversations were taking place amongst children. You know, 13-year-old sees the thing and talks to the 8-year-old about what, what's that about. Um, and all of a sudden, they're having a conversation about something that you really wish they weren't having a conversation about at all. Um, so the technology hasn't actually caught up in some sense, um, but yes, this incredibly powerful tool is at our fingertips. And the questions are, well, how, do we, how can we possibly begin to regulate it, and is it appropriate to regulate it? Um, and I suppose what, what, I would, what I would argue is that we need to take a very prudent approach in terms of how we deal with these sorts of things, and I think the Transparency Bill is exactly that. It is a prudent approach. So it sort of sets out a set of rules and guidelines. What we have to actually figure out is, well, how, how do we now enforce it? Um, and I suppose here there's something that's very, very interesting. We, ha we just talked over lunch about a project that the, the, the referendum transparency people are doing with, that's very manual. A lot, of the, um, a lot of the policing that's done on the internet by many of the social media companies is actually manual. They have thousands and thousands of people who just look at stuff and say, well, actually, that looks bad. We're not going to allow that one. Uh, that looks okay. We're going to allow that. These technology companies still haven't caught up with, this with, some, with some aspects of this technology. That's something we really need to, we really need to bear in mind. So, uh, look, I think um, we're living through an, area, an era of um, massive transformation. We have built a tool that is bigger than any nation state that we've ever seen on the planet. It is tremendously powerful. There are all sorts of... Um, uh, objectives and goals and agendas. Some of them are political, some of them are just mischievous, some of them are just simply, well, I want to, I want to commercialize your data a bit more, so please give me more data. Um, and we have to understand that, um, and I think it's a really challenging space. It's also a space where it just simply hasn't lived long enough for us to really understand its effects. So I suppose in that sense, we, sort of, we should be using, you know, common sense, judgment, whatever, to, um, I suppose, to think about, well, how should we start controlling or regulating uh, in some way that doesn't get in the way, but sort of is protective. And I suppose, ultimately, when it comes down to elections, you know, these are about, these affect people's lives in a particular jurisdiction. And frankly, in my view, the only people who should have any influence over an election are the people who are directly affected by the consequences of those. And so any, any legislation that sort of protects that, I think, is a good thing. So thank you very much.